Oldie 640 KTIB. Good evening, everyone. This is Bayou Sports Talk. I'm your host, William Taylor, and hopefully I won't be speaking as fast as I did last night. But it's always good to hear it. listen to all of you again. Our phone number is 447-9006. A lot of sports to talk about last night, and of course, if you were listening to KTIB, that Hornets game turned out to be somewhat of a downer, unfortunately. A final score last night, Milwaukee 108, New Orleans 93. We'll be talking about that a little more later in the show. But that third quarter really became a runaway. At one point, the Milwaukee Bucks had a 26-point lead over Hornets. I believe they wound up closing the gap to 15. So anyway, that's one of the things we'll be talking about tonight, along with a recap of some of the events going on with the high schools and other things going across the area. So anyway, tonight we'll start off. We'll talk about tonight's NBA games. Here what's, here what's on tap. Boston will be at Detroit. Atlanta will be at the New York Knicks. Philadelphia will be at Milwaukee. Golden State will be at Seattle. Denver will be at Portland. And Utah will be at Sacramento. So those will be some interesting games to watch. Here's a brief recap of what occurred last night. Washington, 98. Phoenix, 93. Cleveland, 104. The L.A. Clippers, 100. Uh, Indiana, 102. Miami, 95. Houston Rockets, 100 over the Memphis Grizzlies, 95. Minnesota, 106. San Antonio, 95. Jersey, 92. Denver, 66. And, of course, once again, Milwaukee, 108 to New Orleans, 93. And that was a, well, a huge route. In fact, I think they said the other night that Milwaukee, I think the biggest blowout they ever had over another team was something like 50 points. So, well, that was a heck of a game last night. And don't forget tonight, LSU basketball. They'll be taking on Florida. You'll be able to hear that broadcast on KCIB. I believe tip-off in the pregame will be a few minutes before. So make sure you stay tuned to KCIB. And here's a look at tonight's NCAA Top 25. Number 17, Wake Forest, will be at Clemson. Number 19, Indiana, will be at Michigan State. Texas A&M will play at number 6, Oklahoma. That ought to be an interesting contest. And once again, number 4 in the nation, Florida, will be at LSU. It will be real interesting seeing how good the crowd will be up there at the team. Last night, two games in the top 25. Number 12, Kansas, 90-87 to victor over number 3 ranked Texas. So that was a bit of an upset right there. Number 14, Connecticut, beat St. John's, 74-68. And a quick look right now at what's going on sports on television tonight. If you're, uh, by the way, on ESPN, of course, at 8 p.m., the SEC will hush you. Of course, you ought to be listening to KTIB tonight for Jim Hawthorne's call of that game. and should be an interesting contest. And before that, at 6 p.m. in the Big Ten on ESPN, Indiana will be taking on Michigan State. And for all of you fans out there that might be fans of sports history like I am, ESPN Classic which I think on Charter Communications in Lafouche is channel 108. At 6 p.m. tonight, I still have an interesting NFL film special called the Super 70s. This will be a look back at some of the great teams and, of, and great individual players of the 1970s. I think in this special, not to give away too much of the fun, but they ranked the Pittsburgh Steelers, of course, as the best team of the football team of the 70s, winning four Super Bowls. And I believe one of, which was, one of which was in New Orleans. That was game nine. So... Oh, also, now this ought to be real interesting. You're not going to listen to the president tonight. 9 p.m. on ESPN Classic, a great classic bo boxing match from 1980, Muhammad Ali against Larry Holmes. So that ought to be a real interesting piece of history to look at as well. Like I said, the Hornets lost last night, 108 to 93. Their next matchup will be Wednesday night at home against Toronto. I believe Vince Carter should be eligible to play for that injury. Tip off for that is 7:30. And the pregame will start at 7 o'clock. And as always, Oldie 640 TCID will be carrying that game. So, and of course, Friday, they'll be at New Jersey, New Jersey Net. The tip-off start is scheduled at 6.30 p.m., so I would assume the pregame for that will be a few minutes as well. And coming up for LSU, we mentioned the Florida game. And then Saturday, they will be at Alabama. And that will also be on TV. Tip-off there will be at 4 o'clock. Pregame will start a few minutes before. Moving along right now, we'll be talking about uh, high school basketball tonight. Here's what's on tap in District 10, 3A. Donaldsonville will be taking on St. Charles. Donaldsonville right now is 7-12 and 12 overall, 1-0 and 0 in district play. And let's see, okay, Lutcher will be playing will be playing St. James. Lutcher is currently 13-7, 0-1 in district play. Uh, St. Charles with a record of 10-12, 0-2 in district play. They will be at Donaldsonville. And let's see, of course, St. Okay, so I got that one right. Don't want to repeat myself too often. I've done that enough last night. District 9 4A. Assumption currently 10 and 8, 
and 0-1 in district play. They will be taking on Morgan Ellender with a record of 24 and 3, 2 and 0 in district play. They'll be playing against Vanderbilt. Morgan City currently 4 and 9 uh, for 1 and 0, 1 and 0 district. As I said earlier, they'll be playing Assumption and finally South Carabine, 7 and 15 overall, 1 and 1 in district play. They'll be taking on White Castle. So some interesting games there. Finally, we'll take a look at 6 5 a Central LaFouche, 15 and 10 overall with a 3 and 3 district play record. Tonight, they'll be taking on Hanville with a record of 20 and 3, 6 and 0 in district play. Of course, this past Friday night, Hanville and Thibodeau duke it out in a one point victory over Hanville. And also, H.O. Bourgeois, 15 and 8 overall, 4 and 2 in district play. Well, tonight, they'll be taking on Thibodeau, 22 and 3, 1 2 in district. And then, of course, let's take a look here. Ah, and South LaFouche. Their next game will be Tuesday against Destrehan. Destrehan with a 13 and 7 record, 4 and 2 overall. And Terrebonne's next game, 10 and 14 record, 1 and 5 in district play. They'll be taking on East St. John. So we got some real interesting games coming up in high school basketball. Right now the time is 4. And let's take a look here at some Saints news, some brief news coming up for all of you, of course, who can't wait for in about six months for training camp to start. The Saints add two free agents to their roster. The Orleans Saints have signed wide receiver Kerwin Cook and quarterback Chris Fenlin to the active roster. Cook, six foot one, 185 pounds, spent part of the 2001 season on the Seattle Seahawks practice squad, signed to their active roster for the last four games of that season. He also went to training camp in 2000, 2002 with the Seahawks. Fenlin, six foot three, 200 pounds, was a three-time captain at Northern Illinois. Finland started 36 of 41 career appearances for the Huskies from 1998 to 2001, producing a school record of 6,788 yards of total offense. Finland completed 510 passes for 6,551 yards and 42 touchdowns during his career. As a senior, he connected on 166 of 331 attempts for 2,036 yards and 14 touchdowns. And basically right now what the Saints are doing in that regard, they're just trying to put together uh, what we used to call some of the camp body members of the team to help fill up the roster. As many of you probably know on the Saints for so long, the maximum number of players you can have in camp is 80, plus you get an exemption for every player you have in the World League. And I think last year at one point the Saints had many as 89 players in camp. So it'll be real interesting to see how they fill up everything. Oh, here, here's a brief, a very brief recap of the Hornets game once again. Michael Red hit six of his eight three-point tries while scoring 22 points in Milwaukee's six condemned 108 to 93 over New Orleans. Ray Allen also had 22 points, and Sam Cassell led the Bucks with 25 points and 10 assists. So, if you listened earlier to Louisiana Live with Jim Inkster and Tommy Chrysan. It'll be real interesting to see what will happen to Coach Paul Silas when the season is over. You know, the Hornets have had their uh, slopes along the way, and hopefully they can pick it up. But when you lose a Aaron Davis because of injury, that's somewhat of a hard thing to overcome. Uh, obviously, easily the MVP of the Hornets team right now. And while the rest of the guys are trying to pick it up, as you might have mentioned or heard the other day, Randy Livingston, they signed a 10-day contract. So, like I said, the Hornets may have a rough, old, a rough road ahead of them. I'll get it out sooner or later. So, anyway. So let's go on to see, oh, once again, a uh, brief week of Aaron Davis. It'll be to repair torn cartilage in his left knee. He averaged 16.8 points and 6.9 assists in 36 games for the Hornets this season. And he'll miss approximately six weeks, though it's not out of the question. He could miss much larger, a uh, much longer period of time for the rest of the season. Uh, Davis tore cartilage in his knee during the third quarter of the January 24-7-96 overtime loss to Portland. The fourth-year pro never missed a game before this season, but he began to struggle with back spasms late last season. In December, he sat out a game for the first time in his career when the Hornets played at Boston, and he confirmed he had a herniated disc. Before Monday, Davis had missed eight games this season because of his back, and when he did play, he usually rested by lying on the floor. But Davis says the knee injury may turn out to be a blessing in the long run because the rehabilitation period will allow him to rest his back as well. And, of course, another big name this year in the NBA, of course, a big name for probably the past 15 years or so, is Michael Jordan. And it says here, Michael Jordan has been selected to the NBA All-Star Game for the 14th time. Now, that's absolutely amazing right there in and of itself. Eastern Conference team as a reserve. He joins Jerry West and Carl Malone 
for the second most all-star selections in NBA history behind Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's 19. Also chosen by the league's coaches for the Eastern Conference team are Jason Kidd of New Jersey, Paul Pierce and Antone Walker of Boston, pardon me, Brad Miller of Indiana, I hope I pronounced his name, Zarendris Uptus, I hope that's how it's pronounced, of Cleveland, and Jamal Mashburn of New Orleans. Now there's a name I can pronounce. The Western Conference reserves are Shaquille O'Neal of the Lakers, Stephon Marbury and Sean Marion of Phoenix, Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki of Dallas, Gary Payton of Seattle, and Chris Weber of Sacramento. And I, I thought it was hard just to pronounce Joe Andrahovsky. I know last night I butchered some names on the high school with Palema, and it should have been Clement. So, and I believe the young man from the Hornets, uh, Maglor, I kept pronouncing Maglor. And so I'll get the hang of this sooner or later. So anyway, up tonight, also one thing I want to talk about that I, I should have mentioned yesterday, but there's obviously there's so much going on in the world of sports. Uh, Saturday is a prelude to the Super Bowl. Many of you might have heard that the National Football League announced the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Duck for 2003. I believe the ceremony is going to be held in either late July or early August at its traditional home of Canton, Ohio. Now what's funny, a press release came out that the Green Bay Packers and the Kansas City Chiefs will play in this year's uh, Hall of Fame game in Canton. Hank Stram, finally, I, I think he's probably been deserving of a Hall of Fame nod for over 20 years, has finally gotten the induction that he is. Many of you may remember Hank. He was the head coach of the Dallas Texans, and then which later became the Kansas City Chiefs in 1963, and for a brief time, 76 and 77, was head coach of the New Orleans Saints. So here's the list here. Marcus Allen, the longtime running back for the Los Angeles Raiders, who, of course, I grew up as watching the Oakland Raiders, and the Kansas City Chiefs. He ended his career in 1997. He was the year in the strike-shortened year of 1982. Rushed for 191 yards and two touchdowns in that famous Super Bowl 18, which was in January of 84, and was named the game's MVP. First player to rush for more than 10,000 yards, now more than 5,000 yards receiving, all pro in 82 and 85. He was the league MVP in 85 and played in six Pro Bowls. And it was kind of interesting, Marcus Allen, finest running back probably in league history, and at one point him and Al Davis had a huge falling out. I believe it was back in 1990 when Marcus Allen said some things on, I believe it was a halftime spell on Michaels, that, well, you can understand Al Davis didn't appreciate that much. So Marcus Allen, for about most of 91 and 92, was benched because Al Davis was trying to hurt his chances of getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Well, as many of you remember, around 92 into 93 is when the uh, NFL reached an agreement with the Players Union over free agency uh, because of the long-standing court case that was going on. And Marcus Allen got to be one of the first group of free agents, and he signed on with Kansas City. It was a good thing that he did. turned out that he still had a lot of good years left in him. Another gentleman in the Hall of Fame class for 2003, Alvin Bethea, or some people pronounce it Bethea. Defensive end for the Houston Oilers from 1968 to 1983. For you kids that don't remember, that's the Tennessee Titans. That was what used to be the Oilers prior to 97. He retired holding three team records. Most seasons with one team with 16. Most career regular season games played with 210. Wow, that's amazing. Most consecutive regular season games played with 135. Had a high 16 sacks in 1973 and was selected to eight Pro Bowls. A very well-deserving uh, no nominee right there. I believe Bum Phillips was his coach for most of those years from 1974 to 1980. Joe DeLamalure, the guard for the Buffalo Bills from 73 to 79, and for the Cleveland Browns, 1980 to 80, 84, is another nominee. Selected All-Pro uh, and All-NFC, AFC, excuse me, from 75 to 86 Pro Bowls. And the Associated, uh, Players Association rather named him Offensive Lineman of the Year in 1975, and he was named to the NFL 1970s All-Decade Team. Very versatile offensive lineman. Of course, in Buffalo, he had the block for folks like O.J. Simpson and I believe Roland Hooks, which was obviously more of a running-style offense. He goes over to Cleveland when Brian Seif was there. And that was more of a pass-oriented offense, and Joe DeLamalure did very well in both kinds of schemes. So congratulations. And James Lofton, who a lot of you probably know in recent years as a broadcaster for CNN and other networks. Wide receiver, Green Bay Packers, 78-86, to 86, the L.A. Raiders, 87-88, then later Buffalo Bills, L.A. Rams, and finally the Philadelphia Eagles in 93. First player to score a touchdown in three different decades. That's amazing. 764 passes caught for 14,004 yards, an NFL record at the time of his retirement, 75 touchdowns scored, 
at 35, became the oldest NFL player to have more than 1,000 yards receiving in one season, named All-Pro four times, and was selected to eight Pro Bowls. And finally, Coach Hank, who, by the way, called me uh, before the show today, a wonderful man. He, uh, he flew back Saturday from San Diego where he was part of the Hall of Fame and Super Bowl festivities out there. He'll be leaving in a couple of days, with him and his wife. They'll be going to Honolulu. All of the Pro Bowl uh, selections here that I just mentioned to you are going to be honored, I believe, during pregame of the Pro Bowl out there this coming Sunday, which will be on ABC. Coach Hank, as I said earlier, coached the Dallas Texans, Kansas City Chiefs, at Chiefs and the New Orleans Saints. Overall record, 131 wins, 97 losses, and 10 ties. Postseason record, 5-3 won the AFL championships of 1962, 66, and 69. And in that 66 uh, AFL championship allowed his team, Kansas City Chiefs, to go to the Super Bowl. And like I said, how appropriate it is that the Chiefs and the Packers will play each other in the Hall of Fame game when Coach Graham will be inducted. I think that was a very appropriate decision by the league. And once again, two Super Bowl appearances. They won Super Bowl four over the Minnesota Vikings 23-7. Lost, of course, to Green Bay in the first Super Bowl. And he developed the moving pocket. Now, this is a great story for a lot of folks that may not know the story. The moving pocket is a style of offense where basically the blockers somewhat move in the direction that the quarterback scrambles. This is a design play. And Hank designed it because when he would play against the San Diego Chargers in the early 60s, the Chargers had two huge defensive ends, Earl Faison and Ernie Ladd, who ironically later played for Hank Stram and the Kansas City Chiefs. So to try to get away from those two big guys, in came the moving pocket. So that, that was a pretty neat innovation. Also developed stack defense, where at any one given time, you could rush anywhere from three to seven men along the offensive line, uh, along the defensive line, to kind of create a defense, a deceptive type of defense. So Hank had a lot of good innovations in it and named AFL Coach of the Year in 1968. Now hopefully, if I can get this sound bite queued up properly, uh, and hopefully it will come through all right. We got a bit of a soundbite from that Hall of Fame uh, nomination of Hank Stram when he was first contacted. And so if I can hit the right button, let's hear what uh, Hank had to say. And this is a pretty neat little uh, bit of information. So let's hear what he had to say. Present the Pro Football Hall of Fame class of 2003, and they are in no particular order market balance. Elvin Buffet, Joe DeLamalua, James Lofton, and Hank Graham. There are, five, there are five members of the class of 2003. For the time we have Hank Graham on the phone, Hank is the John Banker from the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah, hey, John, how are you? Well, I'm doing great. How about you? Oh, I'm like the bottom of the first place. <laughs> the bottom of the first place. Good <laughs> deal. Well, Hank, you've uh, been waiting a long time for this, and I know a lot of people were for you, and, and now it's taking place. And how are your feelings right now? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very heartwarming feeling. It really is. You know, to look back and think about all the people that you have met, that's been a first year in the West, and you guys at the Hall of Fame, I'd like to have been to me throughout the years. And, and uh, just, uh, you know, that's the best way to say it is it's very heartwarming. You know, it's such a special occasion, and uh, so meaningful. And it, uh, I, I, feel, I feel so gratified And there you have it. Hank Stram, uh, shortly after the announcement that he gets inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And well-deserving honor for such a great guy and a guy who uh, really loved the Southeast Louisiana very well. In fact, when he uh, was fired from the Saints after the 77 season, uh, he decided to, him and his wife decided to settle down on the North Shore near the Covington area. And I tell you what, folks, uh, uh, hopefully one day next week we're going to try to get him on the show to talk about his life and times. He's got a lot of funny stories that happened to him along the way. So once again, congratulations to Hank Stram. Well, right now the time is 5.38. I think we'll uh, go ahead and take a commercial break right now. Once again, you're listening to Bayou Sports Talk on OD640 KCIB, sponsored by Rouse's Supermarket, and we'll be right back in just a moment.
640 KCIB, your home for LSU sports this Tuesday as we broadcast LSU basketball. The LSU Tigers take on Florida. Pre-game begins at 7.30 p.m. with a tip-off at 8 p.m. Catch every LSU game on Oldie 640 KCIB. LSU Sports on Oldie 640 brought to you in part by Chippewa Chrysler Dodge Jeep, 1505 Canal Boulevard, Emil Furniture and Appliance, 609 St. Mary Street, and Pelican Dollar Casino, Grand Caillou Road in Anahoma. Oldie 640 KTIB gets your morning started with the most local news and information. Join me, Shane Warner, every weekday morning starting at 6 and stay with KTIB throughout the morning and we will keep you up to date on all your local weather, news, and sports. After your extended 8 o'clock newscast, it's dialogue with Steam Richard. Plus, we've got plenty of chances for you to win and get your day going with only the best music. It all happens weekday morning starting at 6 right here on Oldie 640 KTIB. When is the last time you had a really good tea cake? Not some coffee cake mistake. Not some donut in disguise. Baby, I'm talking about a real king cake. Louisiana's best king cake from Louisiana's best. Rouse's. Rouse's starts with an award-winning gourmet cinnamon dough. Soft cinnamon dough that's baked to a golden brown. Drift with Rouse's famous white icing and topped with real Louisiana sugar. This ain't no pretended croissant. It's the king of the cake. Traditional or filled with your favorite flavor. So do yourself a favor. Pick one up today. And if you know someone loves them for Louisiana, Rouse's got you covered there too. Rouse's ships anywhere in the continental U.S. Just call the Rouse's King Cake Hotline at 1-800-688-5998. That's 1-800-688-5998. Or order online at Rouse's.com. Rouse's King Cake. Louisiana's best. OB 640 KEIB presents So In Your Bowl. Every Saturday from 11 to 12 noon, recipes for the good life. Great food, great music, with Chef Johnny Jambalai for a local of Nottaway Plantation. Join Johnny and friends as they go treasure hunting for the great cooks and musicians of South Louisiana. We visit the great recipes and songs that make us what we are. So In Your Bowl, brought to you by Ralph's Supermarkets, every Saturday at 11 a.m. on OB 640 KTIB. Surf on over to KTIB's home of the web, www.kcib.com. Log on for daily updates of all your new sports and weather. Check out the Biden Sports Talk page for our schedule for the New Orleans Sports and LSU basketball. Check out the show section for info on all your favorite shows here on KTIB. Surf on over to the Soul Your Home section to get your favorite recipes and find out the guests for this week's show. Much, much more. That's the only 640 KTIB website. Located on the World Wide Web at www.kcib.com. And welcome back to Bayou Sports Talk on Oldie 640 KTIB. This is William Taylor, your new host. And I tell you what, it's a real honor to take the place of Brendan Mathern. In fact, Brendan was so generous to me, he even gave me his KTIB 401k, although I was greatly invested in Enron stock. So thank you, Brendan, if you're listening right now. And also, you notice, folks, I'm a little bit slower in talking than yesterday. I got a little excited. And, you know, my father gave me great, great advice. He told me to make sure I slowed down. Of course, one time he also told me to stick my head in the chipper, but I wouldn't advise that for you to do that either. Now, keep, now stay tuned to the show, folks, because when we get near the end, we're going to be giving away uh, two pairs of boxing tickets. Thibodeau Civic Center presents boxing, and this will be, and it's also sponsored by the Boxing Gym. This is Saturday, February the 1st at 7 p.m. Now, like I said, these are general admission tickets we're giving away. We're going to give away two pairs towards the end of the show, so, so don't call yet on the ticket. Right before we go off, we'll get you that information now part of the new thing i wanted to do with the show and it's called trivia think pad we want to get everybody thinking a little bit now this question is not for a prize we're going to get the tickets away separately but see if any of you remember this question name the former lsu football player who was the coach middle linebacker in super bowl three i think he wore number 53 when he was with baltimore Name the LSU player who was the Colts' middle linebacker in Super Bowl III. Now, that's just for fun. We'll be giving away the prize separately later. And also in a few minutes, we're also going to be doing another edition of the Closet Sports Soundbike. I had to dig through the closet, see what fun stuff was in there, and I think y'all might like the soundbite we'll do today. And, of course, many of you know me from trying to follow Saints history, and while I do my best, I'll put it to you that way. And on this day, January 28th, uh, Saints' birthday is Mike Fultz who was a defensive tackle for the team born in 1954. Tommy Hodgson, I mean, I mean, I'll get it out. 
name any other few people will remember, born on this day in 1967. So if I do my math, he would be 35 years old today. So happy birthday to him. I'm sorry, 36. I got to remember it's 2003. Uh, the brain is fading, but I'll, I'll hang through it, folks. Don't worry. And former Saint Senator Jeff Ulenake, born on this day in 1966. So that would make him 37 years old today. Of course, Tommy Hodgson, I remember a little bit more when he was in New England before the Saints picked him up in 94 and 95. Mike Fultz is a real interesting story. He was a defensive tackle for both Hank Stram and Dick Nolan, 77 to 80. And his career almost came to an end when the Saints played Buffalo in 1980 in the Superdome. And Conrad Dobler, the former Saints uh, guard, got traded to Buffalo during the offseason. And during the game, he leg with Mike Fultz and broke his leg for a few weeks. So... I tell you what, football can be a dirty game. It was a heck of a lot dirty when you had to face Conrad Dobler, and he easily was the forerunner before Cal Turley uh, became such a wild man himself. So anyway, once again, Oldie 640 KCIB, and we're having a lot of good sports information tonight. Notice it's a lot easier now that I talk slower. So if only Mr. Acosta, my old teacher, Mr. Acosta from St. Charles Elementary, could see me now. He just loved to pick on me when it came to sports, and... Great bunch of people I grew up with. Now, here's an interesting story, folks, I dug out of the archives. You know, it's unfortunate when you pick up the paper and you see someone that has passed away. Now, here's a real interesting uh, bit of uh, novelty in the world of sports. Charlie Lupica. That's probably a name most of you never heard of in sports. This man, who unfortunately passed away at the age of 90 on December 24th, his claim to fame in the world of sports, in 1949, he sat on a flagpole platform for 117 days in support of the Cleveland Indians. The purpose of Lupica's ordeal was to rally the Indians out of their seventh place doldrums and hopefully back into pennant condition. Lupica vowed not to come down until either the Indians won the pennant or were eliminated from the pennant race. After the team was eliminated from contention, team owner Bill Beck, who if you're a baseball fan, you know Bill Beck was the king of promotions. Sent a truck and transported the flagpole with Lupica still on the platform to Municipal Stadium. Well, that's great. The Indians finished third in the American League that season. The delicatessen owner, delicatessen owner, I'll get it out, stayed on the perch until his last day of the season when he came down to the cheers of 34,000 fans. Now, I'll tell you what. You try that today, you know, they, they'd probably lock you up in the funny farm or something. But, oh, goodness. I mean, the baseball promotions Bill Beck used to come out with, many of you might remember, uh, I think it was back in the early 50s when Bill Beck was at the St. Louis Browns, Eddie Goodell was a midget, if that's the politically correct term I can use these days. Three foot seven, and he, for lack of a better word, he snuck through a loophole with Major League Baseball to get Eddie, Eddie Goodell to, to, pay, to play baseball for the Browns for one game. It was on a Saturday. And, of course, what had happened, he snuck Goodell's name in on the, uh, I think, well, for lack of a better word, something similar to the waiver wire, j just before the closing day on a Friday at, at the Major League Baseball offices in New York. And then uh, when they found out, the Major League author officials found out what happened the next day, they told Beck, uh-uh, don't do that again. So Bill Beck, the king of promotions, and... That's something else. Charlie Lupica, 90 years old. What a heck of a promotion that was. All right, once again, you're listening to Bayou Sports Talk. Let me, right now at 547, let me give a brief weather update for everybody. Since I got this degree in meteorology, I might as well use it. Today's high in Thibodeau was 68, the low was 40. And tonight, a 30% chance of showers, mainly late going towards dawn. There will be some patchy fog out there as well. So those of you that got to get up real early tomorrow morning, please be careful. Uh, lows 55 to 60, south winds at 5 to 10. And for tomorrow, morning fog, it'll be cloudy most of the day, 30% chance of showers, highs 65 to 70, southwest winds at 10. Wednesday night, still mostly cloudy, a 30% chance of showers and thunderstorms, though that'll be with an approaching cold front that's scheduled to stack down. Lows tomorrow night, 50 to 55, southwest winds 10 to 15, becoming westerly at 10. And Thursday, mostly cloudy, 30% chance of rain. This will be, I believe, after the frontal passage. Highs will be 60. And Friday through Sunday looks pretty decent with highs in the 60s. Our next rain chance after that is scheduled for Monday with a more stronger cold front scheduled to come through. So that's your brief little weather update right there. And once again, everybody, the other day the Super Bowl was just a huge event. And real briefly, and I was looking up these records, I got an interesting story for us about how 
uh, the pro football playoffs actually began, and it really began by accident, if there's such a thing. When the National Football League got started way back in 1920, it was originally known as the American Pro Football Association. And if my memory is right, to get a franchise in the league, all you had to pay was $100. That's it, flat 100 bucks. And so back then in the early days, they had a lot of teams, and some of them went out of business during the season, some joined the league during the season. Back then, it was very loose in the 20s and early 30s, and teams often scheduled each other on a week-by-week -week basis. Well, the rule was every, every game had to be sanctioned by the NFL to count the standings. And you could play anywhere from, I think it was, eight games to more than 12 games. It just depends on how much money you want to try to make. The rule was, I think at mid-December was the cutoff date. The team that had the highest winning percentage was automatically declared the NFL champion. Well, in 1932, there was a problem. Mid-December came, and when the, all the, the final statistics had to be in, the Chicago Bears and the poor Sip Ohio Spartans that today we know as the Detroit Lions, they wound up tied with the same winning percentage of 0.75 or 75%. So the league decided what we're going to do. You know, this has never happened before. So they decided to have the first ever playoff game, and it was going to be held in Chicago. But the only problem was they had a huge snowstorm two days before the game. And they couldn't clear Wrigley Field nor Soldier Field in time to, uh, you know, to get the game played. So they moved the game indoors to Chicago Stadium, which basically looks like the old LSU Cow Barn. It's a rodeo arena. And it's a dirt surface. And when they had to go get ready for the game and paint the chalk lines on the field, unfortunately, you can guess there was still some cow poop that the players had to dodge. But it was a little bit narrower field. It was about 40 yards wide instead of 53. And the length of the field was about 120 instead of 100. But the, the players agreed to the compromise. They didn't have any goalposts for the game. The interesting bit of trivia in this game that set NFL history, they had a new rule. If anybody was tackled within so many feet of the sideline because of the narrowness, the ball would be moved back to the middle of the field. And that became the forerunner of hash marks which the league introduced a year later in 1933. So the people with the league after playing this one game thought, you know, we ought to do this every year. So in 1933, the NFL weeded out the weaker team, created the Eastern Conference and Western Conference, which at that time was just one division each, and hence the National Football League Championship game began from that year and that point on. The first year, I think Chicago won it. And, but the other rule was back then, they had to alternate between uh, sites each year, like the first year the Western Conference champion ho hosted the game, the Eastern Conference champion hosted it the next year. And of course, there's no way you could imagine that, this, you know, what, some 70 years ago, the championship of the NFL would be as big as it is today. Well, in 1934, now this is a real funny one, the game was held in New York at the polo grounds between the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears. And what ended up happening, there was a cold front that came through overnight before the game, and the field froze from all the dampness that was there from a, a previous system. And the cleats of the players couldn't penetrate the dirt field. So what they ended up doing, uh, Tim Merrow was the owner of the Giants. And they said, well, let's go get some basketball shoes because the traction moved better just like a basketball court. The big problem was back then none of the stores opened on Sunday, so they couldn't go to a convenience store, I mean a uh, department store. So Tim Merrow had a friend that owned a private school called him on the phone and said, can we borrow your basketball shoes? He said, sure, but the guy that has the keys to the gym isn't in town. So Tim Mara agreed that two of his uh, Giants associates would actually break into the gym, steal the basketball shoes, and they'd pay for the damages. So they did that, and they were able to get the shoes back at the stadium for halftime. So they gave the offensive and defensive starters the basketball shoes. And needless to say, in the second half, because of the great footing, they wound up shellacking the Chicago Bears and at one point one of the Chicago players was so angry he went over to his coach George House and asked him what to do and his answer was well just step on their toes so that's what happened with that and then of course later 1940 that was the year the national championship was held in Washington but many of you will probably remember the Chicago Bears beat the Redskins in that game 73 to nothing I think it was like 28 to nothing in the first quarter the uniqueness about that championship game was that that was the birth of the T formation, which many of us, of course, see in one form or another today. It was actually George Hallis, the head coach of the Bears, gets credit for it, but in reality it was Clark Shaughnessy, who I believe later became the head coach of Tulane, that created 
the T formation. And they just shellacked the Bears in that game. And, you know, many of us today complain about the officiating in the league. We had some incidents where the Giants played the 49ers near the end of that playoff game. And, of course, the way the Pittsburgh-Tennessee game ended. Well, what ended up happening back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the NFL, the NFL didn't even have part-time officials. Back then, members of the media, the hometown team's media, served as the sixth game day officials. The only exception was when they played the championship games back then, what they would do is uh, three of the officials would be from the home team's media, in this case the Redskins, and three of the, the other three officials would be from the visiting team's media, in this case the Chicago Bears. So if you thought officiating was bad now, back then there was a much greater chance of home team biasness compared to today. So that's one little bit of food for thought. A few years later, 1945, the NFL championship game was played in Cleveland. The Redskins against, back then it was the Cleveland Rams, which we later knew as the Los Angeles and then St. Louis Rams. Well, what happened, the night before the game, they knew it was going to get very cold and the ground was wet, but they didn't know how to keep the ground warm to prevent it from freezing. Somebody came up with the idea of putting hay on the field. This is not a joke, putting hay on the field to try to keep it warm. So they got a bunch of bales of hay from an area farm, you know, put them close to each other all over the field. Well, the problem was the next morning, the, the, the hay actually stuck to the grass. So they raked off all the hay they could, but they literally had to play the game in nothing but hay. Final score in that game was 15 to 14, the Rams beat the Redskins. The reason why, uh, back then you might remember if you've seen the old NFL films, the goalposts were on the goal line. And uh, there was a rule. Sammy Ball was the quarterback for the Redskins. He, w he had to back up from his own end zone to throw a pass. The forward pass hit the back of the goal post and fell into the end zone. By rule back then, that was an automatic safety. And that two points was the difference in the Rams being the champion in 1945. So now the next year, they changed that rule where it would just be an incomplete pass. And then it wasn't until 1974 that they moved the goal post to the back of the end zone. Well... Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get to everything I wanted to speak about. So it's about 5.56. We're going to play our closet sports soundbite for the day. And many of you might remember Warren Capone, who played at LSU, a pretty fine player who had a career with Dallas and the Saints. Well, he had a very interesting moment in Super Bowl 10 that we're going to play for you right now. Here is the classic sports soundbite of the day. And there you have it, Warren Capone of LSU fame, a pretty good respectable player. I believe he finished his career with the Saints back in 1976. It was a very good special teams player because I believe he had a block punt against Detroit one year that helped the Saints win. I think back then the punter was Herman Weaver for any of you trivia buffs out there. Okay, let me give you the answer to the trivia think pad question of the day. Name the LSU player who was the Colts' middle linebacker in Super Bowl three. Hopefully I won't screw up this name, Dennis Garbett. Dennis Garbett, and it was a game where, of course, Joe Namath made his I guarantee you our win speech, and the uh, Jets wound up winning that game 16-7 to last Friday on Louisiana Live. Kurt Gowdy called that game. I believe Kyle Roach Sr. and Al D. Regatta Sr. also called the game for NBC. Well, we got about a little over two minutes left in the program. I tell you what, I, I think this second day went a lot oh, much better than that first day. I think yesterday I was trying to beat the Guinness Book of World Records for most information in 45 minutes. I probably would have given competition to that guy who used to do those Federal Express commercials. So, but that was a fun time, and I guarantee you a uh, special thanks, of course, to Linda and the Gene Richard for helping me calm me down after that first commercial break. I know I sound like I had too many cups of coffee on that. Hopefully on tomorrow's show we'll have a lot more to talk about. And, oh, and of course get you those recaps on those high school basketball games that we mentioned to you earlier. Now, of course, program reminder. Oh, and i got two minutes left. i got to also give out the numbers for the boxing tickets. Don't forget, tonight, LSU basketball on PCIB. They'll be playing number four-ranked Florida from the PMAC. 
The tip-off time is 8 o'clock, and of course, pregame will be a few minutes before that. So, in case you're watching the game on ESPN or you may be listening to the president's speech, make sure that your radio is tuned right here to the but, well, to only 640 KCIV, the leader in radio here on the Bayou and all throughout South Louisiana. Now, let's see. We got about a minute left. So, like I said, we're going to be giving away these two tickets to the boxing event. Once again, that's going to be this Saturday, February the 1st at the Civic Center. Start time, or I guess bell time, whatever it is. It's going to be at 7 p.m. And the telephone number, 447-9006. HOMA 876-6464 right now. If you want to get two free tickets to the boxing match coming up in Thibodeau, give us a call on those numbers. Uh, we'll leave your name and you can pick up the tickets tomorrow, or at least pick up the tickets before the close of business hours on Friday, since the boxing event will be on Saturday. So it's about 30 seconds left. Once again, my name is William Taylor. It's good to be with you once again here on Bayou Sports Talk, and we'll be having a lot more to talk about tomorrow. We're going to have another classic soundbite for everybody, and uh, I think it's going to be one a lot of sports fans might remember. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's going to be honoring somebody who has a birthday tomorrow in the world of sports tonight. I think a lot of you might remember. All right. Well, it's time for me to wrap it up. It's good to be with you. Uh, drive safely. Watch out for the fog. And you've been listening to Bayou Sports Talk, 4640 KTIV.